Welcome to Excellence in Policing. And now, Andy Harvey. And welcome to the show. Here we'll talk about all things policing, leadership, mental and emotional wellness, and anything that's going to add value to you and your agency. Our goal here is to increase mutual understanding and respect. And when we do that, we're all better for it. Uh, but let's face it, our world has changed. And if we don't have some fierce conversations, we're going to be left behind. That's why I'm excited to have my first guest, Jeff Halstead. Uh, thanks for being here today, Chief. Oh, it's my pleasure, Andy. Thanks uh, Thanks for the invite. Well, and I'm going to call you Chief because that's how I know you. And, I know, and, and that raises my blood pressure, I, but it's totally okay. I, I know. I'm happy. Now, <laughs> now you're in the tech world and all that, but I'm still yeah. going to call you Chief. So Yes, sir. So there you go. Uh, thanks for being here. You, you've had, I've followed your career when, since you started in Fort Worth and uh, just saw you progress. You were there for, I think, six years. Yeah, a little over six. And, um, and wow, wow, I just can't believe all the things that happened in Fort Worth and in Dallas. I was in Dallas, and so with any large city, just all kinds of things that you have to face as a chief, right. and you have to manage crisis and manage uh, perception and all those things that come with being a chief. That's a hard gig. Yeah, I think without a doubt it's the hardest job in city, county, state government. Um, there are other jobs that are demanding, but there's no other job that's in the headlines that many time uh, during a week or a month. Yeah, so so managing crisis is is really one of the most important things that that you do or we do as a chief. It's about building that confidence in, in the police department, and that's a real important part of that. You know, it used to be. Uh, just several years ago where it took a minute to download a video to YouTube, right? Uh, an officer doing something or whatever. And uh, now it's different. Now it's Facebook Live. We are, we are live. It, it is literally live yes. PD. Uh, I want to talk about a little, more, little bit more about your career. Yes, sir. Uh, you started in Phoenix. Did you actually retire? Did you do your 20 years in yeah, Phoenix? Yeah, I did uh, 20 years. Uh Wow, I think it was like 20 years and seven days. So oh, okay. I didn't meet. But, but who's ca you weren't counting. Yeah, well, I yeah. had to count because <laughs> you wouldn't get a retirement oh, from gotcha. Phoenix yeah. unless you had 20. So I definitely was counting the days. Uh, Fort Worth wanted me sooner, and I couldn't pass up a 20-year <laughs> career to start a job a week earlier. So I extended it. But, yeah, 20 years, uh, Phoenix PD started in 1988. And... Um, Got a written reprimand on my graduation speech, which will explain the type of recruit I was. I was, I went from being a bartender <laughs> to a police recruit, and all I did was tell jokes and have fun and make fun of people, and that does not fit in well in a paramilitary environment, I found out. Yeah. So, longest recruit class ever, probably. I was not a good candidate, but not chief, a good recruit. But it turned out okay. It did. So there you um, go. A lot of memos and discipline runs and... I actually think we need to laugh more in policing. I think we've gotten to a place and, and where we've gotten so, um, we're walking on eggshells. Yeah. And I think we just need to laugh more and enjoy our job. We can still do that. Yeah, we can. There's time and a place, of course, for everything. Yeah. Um, I'm still shocked in my consulting role when I go around the U.S., if not the world, at how, how much angst there is just towards each other right. in our profession. and we got to get rid of a lot of that. Yeah. The solidarity has to come back because we are being targeted. Uh, we are we have a focused profession right now, and we are being politically challenged on many of the historic things we do in our profession. So now we got to support one another more than ever. No, you're absolutely right. And what I've seen and uh, what, I've, what I've heard from many officers, there is an unhealthy side to policing. Yes, there is. And, and that's how we treat each other. It's hard enough going out and serving the citizens, and that's challenging in itself. Now we have to deal with uh, with the, some ugliness uh, in, in some uh, some cultures. Now, hopefully, we're getting better at that because we have to take care of each other. Uh, if we don't take care of each other, how in the world do we expect to take care of the people that, that, that we're serving? So that's a really, really important part of our job. Um, I want to get into that a little bit more, but how old were you when you became the Fort Worth Police Chief? I uh, was, uh, in fact, I just had my 45th birthday. I just remembered that. So I turned 45 in September, and then they announced me on like October 18th. I only applied for the job because my <laughs> chief in Phoenix, Jack Harris, encouraged yeah, me yeah. with my experience of Homeland Security and planning massive events that I should start experiencing what an executive interview process is like. And he actually sent me the email of the advertisement for the Fort Worth vacancy. 
and I didn't have enough executive experience to even be a candidate, so I put in for the job. Uh, and I literally only wanted to go through the interview to learn the right, skills right. needed to be successful in these stages of an executive interview process because I wanted to teach a class for IECP. Right, right. And IECP was going to have this for a, a, a year-long class that I was going to teach across the U.S. And then I made the top three. And Then, then you I, really got nervous. Well, then I thought, well, this is going to be a great <laughs> class because now I can have, like, you know, here's the second half of the day. Yeah. How yeah. to survive the one-on-one -on -one interview. Wow. So I just went in and had fun. Um, I, I literally never thought I would get the job. And when I never heard from the city manager, I kind of knew I was just going to get a letter saying thanks, but yeah. no thanks. And then Dale Fistler called me in middle October and said, hey, when can you start? You got the job. You're like, what? And I just bought a new house with my <laughs> wife and two grown, well, almost grown sons. Um, we weren't ready to move. Right. So big changes. No, I get it. And uh, that's what you get for applying. So yeah, uh, shame on me. <laughs> but, but you know what, though? Um, you know, we were told, and I've, I've learned that you don't put in for a job for you guys looking or looking to be a chief someday and looking now, perhaps. You don't put in for a job that you don't really, really want. Without a doubt. And yeah. I, I caution a lot of my friends that have phenomenal leadership platforms, right. skills, and experiences be extremely selective. Now, my wife is a native Texan. She was born and raised in Texas, grew up in Garland. So she wanted to get back to Texas. Sure. And this would have been you know, perfect timing for me. I just didn't think I had a chance. I understand Little that. did I know, <laughs> and what everyone needs to know, how much the political input and political processes play into decision making. I right. didn't know that the city of Fort Worth was looking for an outsider in a respected major city department that was a, a, a thought innovator that could right, come in right. and change and improve a lot of the policies and practices. And that was my career history in, in Phoenix PD. I didn't know that. So the fit happened when I was unaware of it. Yeah, you know what I found when you're doing these interviews and searches? It's all about timing, isn't timing it? Timing is, without a doubt. So uh, as we got, when you get down to the last three, four, whatever that is for finalists, every one of those can go in there and probably do the job pretty well. But it's the timing of what they're looking for, what kind of personality they yeah. want, the culture yeah. of the department, the needs of the city, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of different factors. And what I tell people is, just because you didn't get the job, I mean, it's okay. It doesn't mean it's not a reflection on you or on your leadership Correct. skills. It's just that that other person was the right fit for that time. That's really what it amounts to most of the time, doesn't it? Yeah, without yeah. a doubt. And I was told that in the last process. I mean, my last interview process for Fort Worth, they were talking about the fit. That's what the city That's manager it. and the, the, the chief of staff for the mayor kept saying. Are you the right fit? That's right. Um, and your advice is perfect for all of these others that want to excel and lead. And I still caution everyone, the greatest job in any police department is number two. <laughs> yeah. You almost have yeah. all the salary, and you do have all the power. You're just never targeted <laughs> in a headline, ever. That's right. Uh, but number one, you got to be ready. You do. It is you. And no matter what time of day that incident happened, your name's in that headline. That's it. And they got to be ready for that. That's it. Well, you did a great jo job in Fort Worth, well, and it you. turned out to be a blessing for you, I know, yeah, uh, to be there was for six years. I mean, Fort Worth is top-notch. It still is. I've always admired the city. It's a great city and a great department. Uh, but you did age a little bit, just like the presidents do, right? When they hmm. come in, they look a certain way. As a matter of fact, here's a picture of you when you were in, in uh, ah, Phoenix. Ah, that was my look commander at that photo. Young lad. Yeah, not a gray hair in that mustache. Not, not a gray hair. That's helmet hair right so, there, because so I still rode a motor back yeah. then. Oh, did you really? Yeah, oh, I was I didn't a motor cop, yeah. And that was my motor wings there so that's hilarious but yeah. so that, that mustache survived the motor the air coming through i your... think it's mandated i okay, think in order okay. to be like a real chips motor you need a mustache <laughs> <laughs> otherwise well, you're not going to have that well, respect. I'm, out. I'm out i can't grow a mustache <laughs> yeah you this could. is why i'm jealous of you <laughs> and then uh there, here's you six years later or something like that after um your stint in fort worth or pretty so that was probably to... two years no, almost three years after the commander fo i mean commander photo so I remember getting this photo made. Uh, the fire department photographer, excellent photographer, actually made me look much nicer here. So I was really happy for him touching well, it up. You see a little gray hair coming in. Yeah, creep, without a doubt. through, can't yeah. you? Yeah. And then, you know, you've been in the tech world a little bit, and I found a current picture of you. Uh, 
Yeah, that's more or less the tech world. They just didn't add the goatee. My skin's a little yellow. I can't believe you guys sent me this picture to show here. But Uh, in the tech world, that's commonplace right there. Yeah, I understand. Well, I I know you're a good sport, and uh, I couldn't help myself, right? That that mustache was too much. So um, thanks for being a great great sport. Yes, sir. Uh, so, So, Chief, you have some stories to tell, just like we all do. But this one is really... This was a, this is a, something that I think people should hear because, for me, and if you read uh, Excellence in Policing and what we talk about now with procedural justice and all around the country, it's all about it, how we manage every police citizen encounter. That's what I believe uh, to be the meat and kind of what's important these days as far as building trust and managing perception. It's right at that micro level of managing every police citizen encounter. Tell us about when you were 19 and how with that experience that you had with a with a police officer yeah my uh, i grew up in south florida uh so spring break capital back then so 1983 spring break capital of the u.s and on fort lauderdale beach all of us in college moonlighted in either one of the bars right i was a valley i ran a valley parking lot for the largest nightclub in fort lauderdale uh, my entire life, I wanted a Corvette. That was my dream car. And at 19 year old, I paid cash no for a red way. Corvette. At the same time, Prince's hit song was "Little Red Corvette." So wow. I was living the dream. So you were it, yeah. yeah. Uh, lived on the beach every day. My skin was very dark. I had long hair. Uh, was with my best friend. We both worked the shifts. Finished at about 3 a.m. And the girls that we know, regulars, they went to a modeling school and they said hey can you guys follow us home make sure we get home so i drove one of the girls and these are friends from college and wes my best friend drove two of them took him to their apartment um when well, we, I, I gotta tell you that was very nice of you Jeff, chief i'm a gentleman <laughs> okay. i'm a gentleman <laughs> so i just think she wanted to ride in a corvette but anyway uh so we get to the there's they have an apartment complex where all of the college students live in this modeling school and um, there was an off-duty officer who had his feet up on a table in a security booth, and he was sleeping. Right. Back then with no cables, there's the snowy TV. That's right, yeah. Um, so I asked the girl, well, what do we do? And she goes, oh, just go in the exit because we're first building on the, on the right. And I said, okay. Went in. Wes followed me. Parked. They get up, and we're making sure they make it up to the second level. I'm sitting in my car. Wes is sitting in his Volkswagen. Uh, and then I feel two hands get around my neck and pulls me out of the t-tops of the corvette and slams me on the ground face first and i think and that's my scar on my eye my eye socket and i think i'm someone stealing my car um and then i get picked up by my hair and my pants lifted off the ground carried to the back of the corvette and he slams me face first on my spoiler cracks it and then spins me around, and I'm there's blood in my eye, and I can't see. So I yell at Wes, get this guy off me. And Wes says, I can't. It's a cop. And I go, what? And then he puts handcuffs on me and uh, gets my ID, says he knows I'm a drug dealer and that I'm there dealing drugs. He thinks I'm Cuban. So he starts speaking to me in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. Um, and he gets my license runs me over the radio Wes is sitting in his car scared to death and Wes is a big guy Wes could probably handle his own Uh, and then he realizes I'm just a kid not a drug dealer never even had a parking ticket or speeding ticket and then he unsnaps his gun puts his hand on his 357 and says as he puts the license in my face you tell anybody you tell anybody about this I will effing kill you wow and Wes hears that so he lets me get in my car and I'm so nervous I can't push in the clutch to put it in reverse and I can't leave and he's threatening me to leave before he shoots me. I'm scared so to So you're scared, yeah, yeah. So uh, I make it home. It took him about a half hour to get home. I had a hard time breathing. I'm a little guy. I'm a little bitty kid at 19. I look like I was 13. Um, my dad is waking up. I get home about 5 a.m. My dad is waking up to go to work, and I have blood down the side of my face. There's fingernail scratches where he pulled me out. He thought I got in a fight at the nightclub. I said, no. Right. Police officer did this because I took a girl home after we got done working. So we filed uh, an internal affairs complaint with Fort Lauderdale PD. They refused to investigate the officer, 
and told my dad, hey, your son's lucky he's alive. Wow. He was in a high drug and high crime area with a fancy car. Wow. And the officer had every right to handle the traffic stop the way he did because your son fit the profile of a cocaine dealer they've been looking for. Wow. I only weighed about 120, 130 pounds back then. Literally picked me up like I was a five pound bag of potatoes. Just, wow. He was a big, you know, that's when steroids were big yeah, in law enforcement. Yeah. He was a big dude. Um, I remember his name. Never met him again, but trust me, I'll never forget that wow. very unique yeah. uh, Spanish name. But your friend Wes, big guy, who said he could handle himself. He didn't intervene because did, he, he had that respect for authority. I like, didn't we, know what to, did. like, like, you know, what do I do here? He's an officer. I can't. Right. And so he just had to watch you because he right. didn't know what to do, right? Right. And there's, I will never forget when I was slammed on the ground uh, in South Florida in the spring, early morning, there is um, a lot of humidity, but the moisture of that black top asphalt parking lot, when I get a smell of that anywhere I'm at in the South, instantly I go right back to that time. That's an, being face planted by that cop. And so nothing happened after the investigation. It was unfounded, I guess. And actually, the cop came by about two weeks later to the nightclub um, and just asked the manager if I was working. And he didn't want to apologize. He wanted to intimidate me because my dad went to internal affairs. Wow. And then the manager just, kicked him out of the club, meaning I don't want you here. Get your su supervisor. And then the officer left. So he, he wanted to double down. Yeah, he did. He was quite the jerk. So 19 years old, this happens to you. What do you yeah. think about the police? I mean, what, what's your perception now? I was now, actually right? a law enforcement major, a uh, criminal justice major at my junior college. The Monday I went into my uh, chancellor, to my counselor, and changed my major to really? just business. I didn't want to see any of my law enforcement major friends at all. I wanted wow. to get out of criminal justice as fast as I could. Um, so I changed my major. Uh, and then, you know, just a few months later, had another negative experience. And uh, I had a very, very significant dislike for all of law enforcement for, for a few years. And I want to touch on that other incident that really affected your life because we were talking about it before the show. And uh, but but uh, so you hated the really hated the police. You, is I that hated too that strong one cop for sure. Yeah. And so now you wanted to you, you went from wanting to be a police officer to say, hell no. Correct. Just, what what happened and how many years later do you think i'm going to be a police officer what changed that um i remember the date uh my wife and i got married met my wife on a blind date love of my life i knew i wanted to marry her two hours into our date and then we left uh houston after we got married i mean left uh, yeah houston after we got married but while i was in houston uh the lady who rented us our first apartment as a married couple mm -hmm. Her husband was a Houston cop. Uh, we were, you know, I lived in Houston 85 to 88 and met my wife in 86. So we went into our apartment. And as soon as she said, my husband's a Houston cop, there you you know, go. Yeah. my wife knew right. we right. want nothing to do with these people. Right. So at the same time, there's this guy in the gym I go to. I went to Gold's Gym at the time. And he's a very, very strong, strong man. Uh, and I got to know him in the gym. I just knew his name was Mike. Uh, and then one day I go to the leasing office and Jody's there and she's like, hey, you know, uh, me and my husband still want to meet you guys one night for, you know, go out to dinner, get a yogurt or something. I'm like, no. And then I see a picture and I'm like, who's that? <laughs> she goes, what's well, my husband? I go, that's the guy I know at the gym. <laughs> I go, that's Mike. She goes, yeah, that's Mike. That's my husband. See there. But well, I liked him. Right, right. But right. then I realized he's a right, cop. Right, right. Uh, but he was huge he was my height but 60 pounds of oh muscle gosh. bigger than me he was a power lifter yeah. um he took me on a ride along which was hard very difficult uh sitting in a briefing oh i didn't like it but mike was such a gentle giant wow. and he treated people with such respect right. regardless there of their go. standing whether they're a crack dealer gang banger or just a citizen a victim of a crime Mike was a true professional, but when he needed to turn it on to take control of a situation, oh my Lord, he yeah, did. Yeah. And I I saw that and I said, well, now that's kind of cool. I didn't see that from any other law enforcement right, officer right. I knew my entire life. But uh, Mike Carroll absolutely changed my perspective. Wow. Yeah. See how powerful one person 
can change da, 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 da. that. And, and we have that power, though, right, with every yes, encounter. We, we really do. On and off duty. Yeah, we do. Yes. And people look at us differently. But, see, you had to look at him without the uniform on to even get to him. Correct. Because it, it was going to be too hard, right, because of what happened to you. Uh, and so look at how that affected you. And now you're here 20, 30 years later and all the things that you did in your career. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's an amazing story to me when I hear that. I just, uh, I don't know if I would have, you know, could have made the change. I, I don't know. I Maybe, but I would have taken somebody like that to say, it's okay. We're, we're okay. Come on. Well, and, and it was and, my wife and um, 33 years together. I give her credit for yeah. all the good things in my life. She's the one that told me, you just need to get over what happened and treat this as a new friend period right so perfect, what perfect. what he does for a living perfect my wife has been so amazing at getting my head right right and moving forward so well, that's an important part of policing right having somebody to support Without you and, and uh, talking about mental and emotional wellness so we'll talk about that more in the coming shows because that's an important part of what we do uh, then not too long after that incident you had another incident happened to your family member mm. and, and and only if you're comfortable talking about some of that and how that affected you so now you have this incident when you're 19 then this incident how that changed your world yeah spring break of 83 was you know when i was uh, profiled and beaten up by the cop and my sister my uh, older i have two older sisters the youngest of the two was pregnant this is going to be the first grandbaby in our family big deal i was going to be an uncle wow i thought it was so right, cool right right um so she was due later in uh, 1983, but late summer, um, she called our home and I answered and, and she had been uh, physically abused, was the victim of domestic violence. And her, her husband, live-in husband, was a police officer. And I went over and helped pick her up. She was injured really bad. She was bleeding. She just had back surgery. I had to be careful how I moved her. She begged me not to tell anybody, and I couldn't tell my mom and dad. My dad, oh, my Lord, he would have gone. Oh, really. yeah. yeah uh, I, get, I get it. We all get it. Parents um, get it. And then that, those back-to-back -back incidents within about five months of each other. Wow. Uh, I really, really had such disrespect for the uniform positions of power and authority and the abuse that i seen so closely together was turned off wow all together well you know we I, we can only imagine how difficult that was for you but i go back to wes uh, the, yeah uh, i go back to him you know yeah. he, he he turned it around for you oh mike carroll carol mike yeah, carroll he, yeah. he, he changed that yeah. that picture he of did. us and and uh, yeah. here you are today so because of that also you you did something very very cool there started this program in Fort Worth called One Safe Place. One Safe Place, that's right. And uh, I was reading about it, and it's, tell us a little bit about it, um, about how what the concept is. So my first month as chief in Fort Worth, um, I needed to learn an entirely new agency, new city, new yeah. stakeholders, new culture, everything. I, I was very passionate about victims of family violence yeah. because of my past. Sure, sure. So I... My second week, I wanted to go tour the family investigations unit. And my executive team looked at me funny and said, what, what do you mean? I, yeah. And I went, you know, where all the domestic violence cases come in. I just want to go, I right. want to meet that unit. That's the first unit I want to meet. And my executive team said, we, we don't have one. I'm like, you're, you're the 16th largest city in the nation. Yes, you do. Where is it at? Yeah. Like, we, we don't even have specialty detectives. You're a general detective at one of our patrol precincts. You that's get, one of the ones. So that you can get a stolen bike, many, yeah. a broken fence, or a victim of family violence. That's the level of seriousness it had. Right, right. I was in shock, um, and I remember meeting with uh, one of our advocacy groups, very organized, um, and I told them, "I in one year I want a plan to build a family justice center," and they decided man, we're going to get this done. And then thanks to the generosity of very powerful people, our right. elected officials, right. our former mayor, Mike Moncrief, believed in me. Uh, and the vision, and then all oh, these amazing community leaders came forward and donated 100% uh, of the funds to build the largest family justice center in the U.S., 67,000 square feet. Wow. And everything, one-stop shop for yeah. every victim of family violence. So counseling, shelters, yes. all 
case all work, of that. investigations, yeah. And then you talked about the detectives. They were placed there as yeah. well. And that turned out to be one of the best assignments in the department. Yeah, they yeah. have a beautiful office facility. It's yeah, gorgeous. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't mind being housed there as a chief. <laughs> it was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. But it, we went from a unit that was viewed as like your entry-level job right, right. to now one of the elite investigative right. assignments because you could accomplish so much and change someone's negative go. path that's in right. life that's immediately. Right. That's very powerful. It is, and look what, the, look what happened, right? That turned into, lack of a better word, you, a blessing. What you went through with your sister and you knew in your heart you needed to do something. So here we are, Fort Worth still has it, still thriving. And that's something that you turned into a positive with, yeah. the, with the things that y'all did in Correct. Fort Worth. Uh, very much so. I, I wanna, there's, there's a video, and, and I want to show this uh, testimony of someone that went to One Safe, and it's a very powerful video. And then, then it's you talking about kind of what, what happened to you. Okay. R roll the video. This happened February 19th of 2005. He had gone to Lisa's house that night. The minute he walked in the door, he, he hit her in the face. He brutally beat her until he had her on the ground and smothered her. And that's when Jaden walked in. And um, he killed Jaden also. Jaden just a little boy. And lots of fun. Lots of fun. Lisa was my only child. She was six months pregnant with a little girl. When I was about 18, maybe 19 years old, I know my, my oldest brother went off to college, so I was the only person left in the home. And my two older sisters had moved on in relationships, still in South Florida. My sister was involved in a pretty bad car accident. She was in a lot of pain, but because of her pregnancy, she was really not capable of being mobile. One night, I remember distinctively that she called me and it wasn't her normal tone of voice. And she had called me and told me she just needed me over there immediately, but don't tell mom and dad. I remember walking into the, the bathroom and she was on the floor and it looked, there was a little bit of blood and I had thought maybe she had fallen. I, I helped her uh, walk back to the bed and talk to her a little bit. And she said that her husband beat her and uh, made kind of forced her to have sex with him even though that was against doctor's orders. Her emotions that night and the, the weight now that I carried, uh, I didn't know what to do. I was just a teenager. Wow. Um, so when we see things like that, see testimonies and hear testimonies like that for detectives, and I was a detective, and you get so many cases, we can never forget that every case is a Sheila, and every case is your sister, and every right. case is important. Um, and so just a, just a powerful testimony so thank you for sharing i know that's oh. not easy for you but i think people need to hear that and i think that's a it was very powerful so thank yeah. you chief for that no and i'm, I'm glad um, we had this discussion um i think only three times i've ever talked publicly about it uh, and i've never ever told my parents my wow. mom has passed wow. my dad's still alive but i never told them i just promised my sister i understand yeah well, we're going to switch gears a little bit to kind of uh, okay. get a little something a little softer here. Um, so let's go back to what you're doing. This is really important. You're, you're now our CEO. So you left chiefing. I call it chiefing. Chiefing. <laughs> yeah. You left that, and now you're the CEO of Evertel, which used to be the Blue App. Correct. Many people know. Yeah. T tell us about Evertel and tell us what that's, what that's about. Yeah, I, um, what frustrated me as chief was I could not – two things. I could not – instantly communicate to everyone I needed to via technology securely right and yeah. I could never control the message and that was very frustrating um, and handling a crisis after crisis after crisis I kept thinking there's got to be a better way so when I retired and became a technology consultant primarily body-worn cameras right I got to visit a lot of these very very smart technology minded leaders who told me you can build that I mean, not me personally, but, you know, a company can right. build this. You can do it if you want to. And then I found technology, career technology, business men that wanted to partner with me and build it. So we built it. Now, the first version looked like a Facebook for cops because mm -hmm. we heard that's what they wanted. No, that's not what they wanted. Uh, so our first beta was a failure. And we like to fail. 
yeah, and technology because yeah, yeah. we grow right, and enhance right. and improve. Well, that's so, the same way in life, Chief. Yeah, that's so right. we, we had our product. It was not, it gave them security of communications and control. They wanted instant intelligent right. sharing. And that's then we right. modified our business plan, but it's now uh, Evertel Technologies based in Las Vegas. Uh, and it is compliant communications for first responders and government. We can cover any aspect of city, county, state, federal government. And and, and I know of it because it, I'm in my second, leading my second organization now, and I we got the blue app at the time, now it's right. Evertel. And it changed the way we communicated. So even email has become a thing of the past, it really. Is. Because, is. because officers are off, they're yeah. always complaining. Their number one complaint is we don't hear anything until we see it on the news or Correct. we see it a few days later. And I get it, right? We, I, they wanna be informed just like anybody else. And so what I found was as a chief, what a great way. Ever tell? there you go. And I would send them a lot of things, not just, you know, bolos and crime stuff. I'm talking about, you know, news stories. Hey, be careful out there. Remember this. We're having a luncheon, whatever. Yeah. And and it, they loved it because I was communicating right at their fingertips. And that's something that I didn't have before because, again, email, they're not going to check it, especially when they're off. Are you kidding me? You know this. Yes. And so this allows me, so it's a little selfish reason for me because now I can communicate with them and they can never say, the chief never communicates with me. Well, that's not true because I do it all the time. But then I started seeing them use it with each other. So now squads are using it with other squads. Hey, uh, and sure to call today, look out for this red Mustang, whatever could be responsible for whatever burglaries. And they would upload a picture. Everybody got it. Or a warrant that a detective just signed. Here you go. Put it on there, and everybody had it real time. Yeah. And and they loved it, and it was really. And then here I was just sitting back watching them communicate yeah. with each other. So I'm like a proud dad, right? Look at them. And uh, but they loved it, and it's a great, great tool. Now where I'm at now, it's same thing. Uh, they didn't have any way of communicating. I said, "Come on, I already knew about Evertel. That's yeah. too easy, right? Yeah. Call the chief, and here we go." And within, you even told me it was like the fastest any organization had signed up. I mean, it was within minutes, right? Yeah, you were a hundred percent like before I could get another <laughs> meal in my body. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Had the whole department on it. Yeah, because I got I got them all together from the very. Yeah. Fr I said, "This is what we're doing from day one. This yeah. is what you do," and just like that, they all did it right there, and, and they love it. I mean, it was that they just love the fact that I can communicate with them, and they can. We're still learning because it's a new thing for us. Oh, yeah, and I'll, you're I'll, about to enter into what we call the second level. Oh, the, oh, there's another one because. Oh yeah, there's. You're going to grow oh, on this okay. platform, well, and there. it keeps getting bigger and bigger and more powerful and more powerful. Um, so now you're ready to hit that second level, which is regional communication regional, collaboration, right. uh, and it's no extra cost. And that's what I really, really am proud of with our company. Uh, we are not nickel and diamond agencies. Budgets are tough. Finances are strained. It is just a flat rate price, and it, it, you can do everything. You no, know, it's cheap. It's like two or three bucks yeah, or, or too, something like yeah. that. But but you've been very very good to us, uh, giving us a trial period and all that. And uh, so it's been you've been good to us, and it's been a great tool. But now, so like, I'm a chief in a rural or, or you know outside of the ur urban area, the metroplex, and I think it's even almost even more important because there's some distance between us yes. and uh, crimes happening in my city and then they'll go 10 miles down the road and commit crimes in that city. So it's important that, that we communicate. And, and uh, once we all get on board, it's just, just gonna become more powerful. So. Yes, it is. And you know, we, and I, me personally, I, I know big city policing, major city policing, and so much of our profession are small to mid-sized agencies right. that yeah. are rural. So I wanted something that served them right uh and i we're really really proud of a lot of our areas so far away from a big metroplex yeah they are now instantly sharing the most dangerous people in that? seconds there and they're safer now and yeah. that gives our entire team from engineers to our encryption specialists to our finance team it gives them all a lot of satisfaction that there are tools keeping cops safe Love it. and keeping crime low so keeping cops safe, number one. Then the second part of being safe is liability. And I want you to talk, talk about yeah. that after we look at your uh, website. You have a pretty cool website that people can go see. What is it, Get Evertel? Yeah, uh, yeah, getevertel.com. Uh, what I like about this website is, you know, there's a lot of drop-down boxes towards the top. 
uh, you can literally drill down and find everything. We have uh, information about what is Evertel, the security of the platform, the compliance of it. Uh, we, you spend five to 10 minutes on this website. What law enforcement and government does not realize is not just Texas with their new Senate Bill 944, yeah. but also across the US, as a governmental employee, uh, you are responsible to make sure everything you say and share while working is retained in its original format in a secure area so it can be released if requested. Love it. And a lot of times when you're using consumer apps, you have no access to that data, and that could place you in violation of state law that's a dangerous place to be in as a police officer. You mentioned SB 944, and there are other similar bills across the nation. Yes, there, there are. 30 others. In layman's term, because I got to tell you, a lot of my colleagues don't even know that that even passed yeah. because we're just so busy. And whatever the case, well, what is it in layman's terms? Uh, so Senate Bill 944 was passed and placed into law September 1st of this year. It states that on any personally owned device, anything you say and share work-related, doesn't matter if you're on or off duty, has to be stored in its original format in a secure area wow. immediately accessible by government. No one takes care of their text wow. messages like this, right. which places everyone in violation. So a lot of chiefs are saying, well, I'll just buy a, a, a government phone for everyone. Well, those phone plans are about 60 bucks a month, and you're still frustrated with getting all of that right. data. So for only $2, on any device, the city, county, state, and governmental entity owns all that data in the cloud. It's not on your device, it's in the cloud, and any executive can get in there and get what they need right. because we have to be transparent, we have to be compliant. And so we, we have an open records request, you have it, you, you Evertel will get that for us. No, you actually have it. Oh, we have it, yeah. okay, okay. So as an executive, you oh, can okay, okay. actually approve other executives. You go straight to there the cloud go. at AWS, or we have a GovCloud account, and you get in there, you get your data, uh, and then if you are having trouble getting someone else's data, just let us know. Yeah. Our, all of our technology experts will get it for you, send you a zip file, and you have that, that's it in one seconds. Thing, that's one thing I've noticed about about your guys. That, I mean, instantly. I, I send <laughs> them in. They're fast. Yeah, they're there. I mean, yeah. so uh, the, the customer service is great. So check out Evertel. Um, I'm just telling you from my own experience, it's been thank good, you. good for no, our department. Thank you. It's and, great uh, for our profession. I, I want other people to know about it because it's very, very important that we protect ourselves in that way as well. So uh, so thank you for, for all that you do for Evertel yeah, and, and for my us. My pleasure. And so so uh, one last thing. Um, we want to end it with um, some positive, yeah. what I call an excellence in policing officer. And there's so many great stories out there of officers doing great things. Most of them, you know, we hear all the negative stuff, but they're the positive ones greatly outweigh the negative ones. Trust me. And uh, so I want to highlight an officer. This this uh, this episode, I want to highlight Officer Rodriguez. As we say in Texas, I can't roll my R's. Yes. Yeah, you can say it. And um, he's a California Highway Patrol officer. He answered a disturbance with a deaf woman at the DMV. And let, let's see what happened. Well, heartwarming and the DMV, not usually said in the same sentence. Oh, no. But that is exactly how to describe a scene at a South L.A. office. A CHP officer was called to the DMV on Hope Street near USC for a disturbance. When he arrived, he noticed a woman who was very upset because no one could understand her. Well, she's hearing impaired and was trying to communicate with American Sign Language. And as luck would have it, well, that officer just happens to know sign language and he helped sort out the confusion. He even paid for her ID card because she didn't have enough money. The video of the officer's kindness has tens of thousands of views on social media. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, that's, you know, when I saw that on my uh, social feed, it warms your heart. We know we have people like that every day that's that right. are 10-8, doing that, giving great service. That's right. And thankfully, there's some good balance of the amazing work that they, the big hearts that they have. Yeah. I really love to see that. There's no doubt. And I wish uh, we could capture all of the good stuff that yeah. police officers do. We're not perfect, but I'll tell you what. Th there's way more of that than, than yeah, anything there is. else. So, yeah, there is. Uh, shout out to Officer Rodriguez from the California Highway Patrol. Thank you for being excellence uh, in policing. Um, and I'll leave you with this. Uh, always remember that wearing a uniform doesn't separate you from the community. It makes you more a part of it. 
So thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Chief, for being here. My and, pleasure. And we'll see you next time.